Regents. Please take a moment, check to see if there are any devices such as cell phones, pagers, or other noisy devices are quieted. Please remember that there are no photos allowed at this time during the contest. And time will be allowed after the announcement of winners. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our Toastmaster for this evening, last year's winner of the Humorous Contest. Please join me in welcoming Toastmaster for the evening, Denise Jensen!
participated in the humorous speech contest here in District 30. Her speech title was The Ultimate Sport. And the sport she talked about? Fishing. <laughs> Fishing for a husband. <laughs> she competed at the club level, the area level, the division level, and was a finalist in the District 30 Fall Humor Speech Contest. I counseled her on speaking order, because I said, you don't want to vote first. <laughs> so I told her, wait till everyone picks and you take what's left. It didn't work for her, and it didn't work for me. <laughs> 20 years I have waited to give a rebuttal to that speech. So pay close attention to what I'm going to say, and you may be saying. <laughs> My wife started out the speech by stating order to catch the man of your dreams, you must select the proper bait. <laughs> and the best bait to use? Food. As for gold, steak Diane, cherries jubilee, bananas foster, my wife made all of those dishes for me before we were married. <laughs> After we were married, the favorite thing she liked to make was reservations. <laughs> the second date of choice was having stylish clothes. And I can tell you, before we were married, my wife wouldn't be caught dead in anything designer outfits. After we were married, her favorite outfit, flannel pajamas, <laughs> hair curlers, and bunny slippers. <laughs> the next bait of choice was having an immaculate hunting ground. Before we were married, I would go over to my wife's house she wasn't looking, we would check for dust, there wasn't any dust. We would check for dishes in the sink, there wasn't any dishes in the sink, the bed was made, I was impressed. After we were married, I don't think my wife knew what a clothes hamper was. There were clothes everywhere. I talked to my father-in-law about this, and he said he had the same issue with Helen when she was at home. And so I asked him, what happened? He says, I saw him. What did you do? He told me that once she left the house, he went around and gathered up all her clothes, put them into a big ball, Proceeded to throw him out the window. So I tried it. <laughs> it didn't work. She just went out and bought more clothes. In fact, she bought so many more clothes that the whole shopping network inducted her into their Hall of Fame. <laughs> The next bait of choice is having a hot night. And I can tell you that after we were married, there were many hot and steamy nights at the Roman residence. But it's not what you're thinking. Tell him he doesn't like air conditioning. <laughs> Everything else fails, then there's the thing of making love. Early on in our marriage, I would go to the drugstore and you know buy this certain protection that comes in these packets. 
you know, they had a one pack or a three pack if you wanted to have a hot weekend, or even a seven pack if you were expecting a spectacular week. Well, after we were married a while, I was buying the 12 pack. January. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kine. Contestant number two, Jeff Talbot, in over our heads, in over our heads, Jeff Talbot. We had no way of knowing it would soon come to curse Greg Rock. 
Even his lovely wife, Trisha, whom he's shown here enjoying a nice glass of wine on some unidentified trail. So we packed up his book and our gear to hit the road. First stop, Bullet. Now, Mecca, or home to the best riding service known to man, Navajo Sandstone. At least that's what Greg says. We missed it completely. <laughs> Drive over the Rocky Mountains and shredded our brakes. We just brushed aside that little setback, eagerly attacked our next stop, my Toby Mountain. We set out its gauntlets, helmets, and special shoes, locked and loaded. As soon as we started up the mountain, we knew we were in trouble. The grade was steeper than anything we'd seen that home, and the terrain was treacherous. We had to stop after just 50 yards and console with Greg. <laughs> just grin and bear, he said. Perseverance is a virtue in this sport. You'll be rewarded at the top with a stunning viewpoint. Two hours later, sucking for air, hearts pounding like champion thoroughbreds, we reached the top. At least Greg had been right. The view was worth it. We just sat down for a while and took it all in. Then we heard the sound of car doors closing. And some kids rustled past. <laughs> Mom, look! It's They hooted and hollered. And then, just as quickly as they come, took off. Rather than dwell on the fact that you could just drive your car off. <laughs> Somewhere before. <laughs> Are they the ones from the top? 
to the mountain? <laughs> I could only nod. They sure were. We might have been in over our heads in Utah. To this day, we're glad we did. It did bring us closer together. And we found out we're actually pretty tall. Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you'd be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the things you did do. So sail away from the safe part. Touch the trade winds in your sail. Explore, dream, discover. To which I'd only add, it's half a great deal. The medical procedures will. If the sun and the smoke don't get us, the medical procedures will. Tom. running to my mom with some mysterious ailment, which she would always diagnose the same way. She would take my temperature, poke and prod the area that I said hurt, ask me to stick out my tongue and say, ah, uh, and then she would usually say the same thing. You're fine. It's probably just growing pains. Suck it up and go to school. But it wouldn't be long before I was back with something else, because I was really adept at researching ailments, illnesses, diseases, their causes, and treatments. And the downside of all that knowledge is that to this day I constantly worry about how choices I've made impact my health. Take smoking, for example. I first learned to smoke in the Chicago Alley in the 1960s with two friends and a pack of stolen cigarettes. <laughs> we decided we'd see who could smoke the most cigarettes at the same time. <laughs> Now that was harmless fun. At least we thought about time. But imagine my horror in high school when I found out just what that smoking had done to my lungs. And I heard how well, smoking affects our lungs, our heart, and other organs. I knew that even though it had been years since I had smoked, that I had done irreparable harm to myself in that Chicago alley. In fact, it was just two weeks later when I was struggling in gym class to finish the dreaded two-mile run. My side was burning. I couldn't catch my breath. I finally had to stop and say, Coach! Coach! I can't go on. I'm sure it's a lung tumor. <laughs> he felt my head, poked and prodded, and then he said, You're fine. It's probably just growing pains. Suck it up and keep running. Well, the smoking doesn't get me, the sun sure as well. I thought about that recently when I was at work in the conference room, waiting for a presentation to begin on skin cancer. Mm. You know, I didn't think about the sun damaging my skin when I was growing up. It was the 1960s. We had 
bands like the Beach Boys and movies like Beach Blanket Bingo. We were told that a suntan made you look hip. And I was going to be the hippest guy in the neighborhood. So every day I lathered on that tanning lotion. And I lay in my driveway from 9 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, <laughs> feeling the burn. Yeah, but I was feeling that burn and thinking about all those burns when I was in that conference room. Now, presentations like the one on skin cancer are a great source for hypochondriacs of new information of things to be worried about. <laughs> and in this case, it also was a source of free pasta and salad, thanks to our HR department. The presenter wasted no time starting her slideshow, and I wasted no time digging into the free food. In fact, I just put in a big forkful in my mouth when I heard her use the word melanoma. And for some reason, I looked at the screen where this prune-faced man stared back at me, his face with those cancerous sores that seemed to shout at me, We're coming for you! No! I shouted, spewing food all over the person next to me. I don't remember much from the rest of that presentation. Just two things. The sun is good just not on our skin. And I should always cover my mouth when I'm eating. <laughs> Shortly after that presentation, I woke up with a mysterious pain in my side. I knew it had to be serious. So I went to the doctor, who took my temperature, poked in private, asked me to say ah, uh, and then he said, Tom, I think we're going to have to do Yes! What are we going to do, Doc? He said he took explain to me that I would just drink a shake, and then an internist would decide what's going on inside. I said, great, what's in the shake? Barium. Why did he think I was going to get excited about drinking radioactive ice cubes? Just because they call it a very barium shake? But I did. And soon I was dropped on a machine that was making these strange clicking sounds. Later, I got the bill for my portion, the out-of-pocket expense, $865. And I figured out what those clicking sounds were. It was like a meter on a taxi cab, and every click box made more money. He gave me the results a couple of days later. Everything looked fine in the area of the scan, but we thought we saw a shadow on your spleen, so I like to do another procedure. What do I have to drink this time, Doc? Oh, no, don't worry. We'll just inject the radioactive material directly into your bloodstream. <laughs> Great. And shortly I was strapped onto another machine with a new technician hovering over me, fresh from his tour at the Guantanamo detention camp. <laughs> this technician had a unique bedside manner. We can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. The easy way is if you don't move. Because every move, we got to follow. And I want your hands out of the way, up on your head, like this! Now try this if you want. It's comfortable for maybe a minute. But after five minutes, my muscles start to tighten. And after 12 minutes, I was feeling intense pain. I knew I had to do something, but I didn't want to alert the guard, I mean the technician. And so I remember seeing a contortionist in the circus who slowly moved his arms, and I tried to mimic that. And I thought, that contortionist got paid for this. I'm paying for this pain. How much did I pay? Let's just say that my family took a staycation this year. <laughs> and when people say, what did you do with your summer? I say, oh, you want to see the photos from my liver spleen scan? <laughs> the doctor called me a few days later, and I went to the office for the results. Turns out that everything was fine. He said, it looks like it was just growing pains. <laughs> Lose some weight and suck it up. <laughs> I left his office with mixed emotions, knowing that if the sun and the smoke don't get me, the medical procedures don't. <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Time. Contestant four, Jason Peck. I love your accent. I love your accent, Jason Peck. The American author P.J. O'Rourke once described the English as cold-blooded liars with rotten teeth and no sense of humor, who once conquered half the world but have yet to conquer dental hygiene. <laughs> Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and anyone who loves my accent. To be clear, this is an English accent, I'm not Australian. If you're not sure how to tell the difference, Robert Williams once said, the Australians are like English rednecks. <laughs> Can you remember the first time you went to a different country? Or maybe the first time you went to a different state? Did you feel the culture was very similar to back home, but just a little different? There are a lot of similarities between England and America now. England has an obesity problem. In fact, it's so bad that two out of three people have become four out of five people. <laughs> <laughs> when I immigrated to the US two years ago, I noticed there were some differences. And they were with the language, humor, and attitude. I first noticed a difference with language when I met my brand new American mother in law. She looked at me with her long, dark hair, tilted her head to one side, and said, Jason, I've always wanted to go to England, but you guys don't talk English. <laughs> there are subtle differences between British English and American English. When I was a kid, I used to collect erasers. There were also different types, and some of them were fragrant. But in England, we call erasers rubbers. And I forgot that over here, rubbers mean something else. <laughs> so when I told my mother-in-law about my hobby, I said, when I was five, I used to collect rubbers. <laughs> Your mother was okay with that? Oh, sure. She used to buy them all for me. <laughs> really? Yeah, I used to hand them out to all my friends. <laughs> what? I hold them in my hands and smell them.
kind of pessimism. And she said, do you know even the homeless are optimistic here? I saw a homeless man refuse to take a cigarette from a normal homeless person because he didn't like the brand. <laughs> so I said, does that mean in America beggars can be choosers? <laughs> and she said, what? Before I emigrated, my mother said to me, uh, uh, Jason, I, I, I'm not sure you should go. So I said, well, why not? Mom? And she took off her pink glasses, looked at me and said, well, in America, they don't talk English. <laughs> I really struggled with whether I should emigrate. And my mother scratched her blonde hair, looked at me and said, Jason, you've got to make a choice. Are you going to say yes to safety and stay here? Or are you going to say yes to adventure and go to the US? Those words have a profound effect on me. When was the last time you said yes to adventure? It doesn't have to be anything huge like emigrating to another country. It could be something small, like trying a new restaurant. Or maybe that business idea that you've always had. <clears throat> Next time you travel, remember there can be differences with language, humour and attitude. And for goodness sake, be careful how you use the word rubbers. <laughs> Contestant number five, George Stapleton, a mother in need of rehab, a mother in need of rehab, George Stapleton. Out of the pie 
and bites off her nose. Yes. <laughs> Remember the Sprats? Jack who could eat no fat and his wife who could eat no lean? What we have here is a couple in dire need of medical help. <laughs> Yet between the two of them, they pick their plates clean. <laughs> this is a classic case of a very unhealthy mutual codependency. <laughs> Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Jack, jump over that candlestick. <laughs> A lit candlestick, mind you. What an invitation to toddlers fascinating with matches and fire. <laughs> Re reflect for a moment on those three blind mice. <laughs> whose tails were cut off by the farmer's wife. <laughs> Sightless as they were, can we really believe they were chasing her around the house? <laughs> In any case, she could have easily lulled them outside. But no! Chop! 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 <laughs> Another case for the PETA people. <laughs> Should I recite for my granddaughters the ladybug rhyme? Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. Your house is on fire and your children are gone. Gone as a dead. Should I tell them about Peter, Peter, the pumpkin eater? He had a wife. Not <laughs> we know what that means. <laughs> she was fooling around on it. <laughs> and what does he do? He locks her up. <laughs> Sex, violence, <laughs> animal cruelty. Parental neglect, child abuse. These things are found regularly in Mother Goose rhymes. My granddaughters might as well be watching reality TV. <laughs> oh, something else. Sexual harassment. That was a theme of a rhyme that annoyed me intensely when I was young. Georgie Poetry. <laughs> oh, how the other boys loved to pester me with that rhyme. Georgie Poetry put in a pie. You kissed all the girls and made them cry. And when the boys came out to play, oh, Georgie Poetry, <laughs> you ran away. <laughs> it's a wonder that we Georgians by this rhyme, did not grow up with huge identity problems, <laughs> or, or even become sexual perverts. <laughs> now, I realize that Mother Goose may not have been a real historical person, or if she was, if she's long dead. But in my imagination, I picture her now living lavishly off her royalties <laughs> on some big estate. And I see her one morning opening up her email and finding this message. Old Mother Goose, putting it by, you scared lots of kids and made many of them cry. But not my little granddaughters, if I have a say, from your strange, offensive rhymes, I'll keep them far away. <laughs> Signed, Georgie Porgy. <laughs> Thank you.
May we have one moment of silence, one minute of silence while the judges mark their balance. Mr. Time keep your signal leave me with the green light for that one minute of silence. Thank you, Mr. Timekeeper. Contestant number six, Shelby Peterson. The national deficit is not funny. The national deficit is not funny, Shelby Peterson.
You know what we have a lot of every summer? Road construction. <laughs> Asphalt and orange cones have got to be pretty expensive. I bet we can save the nation a ton of money if we just cut down on road construction projects. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. Some of the roads are going to get a little rust. Just think of it this way. If the roads are bad, more people will walk instead of drive, right? <laughs> Thank you. Everyone, please remain silent while the judges complete their ballots.
join me on stage in the order that you spoke for a brief interview. Former 
teacher. What did you teach? Uh, world history, American history, mother goose. <laughs> Thank you. 